take a minute. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Okay, good I'm evening. Ready. Good evening. Welcome to the you ready? <laughs> Welcome to the Healthcare Disparities Conversation. I'm Dr. H, of course, as you guys know. And I have two phenomenal, phenomenal people joining me tonight in the conversation. And um, I'm so excited to have Chastity, my girl from Ski, um, and my favorite neighbor who left me and moved away, but it's okay. His name is Mr. Jimmy Cooper. And uh, tonight we're going to really start breaking down the healthcare disparities in the Black community. Um, because we really want to identify uh, what's going on, what these disparities are, and then start thinking about solutions that will lead us to healthier, better versions of ourselves. Um, you know, my thing is you need to take your health into your hands. What do I mean by that? Don't just take somebody's word for one diagnosis and think that that's the end of it because that's not. You know, one person's um, diagnosis is not the end all to be on be all. So think about, you know, what what are some situations that you've probably been in that you knew that diagnosis was kind of off and you knew you got subpar service um, and you kind of went with your gut. It could have went a totally different way if you didn't go somewhere else. So tonight we're going to be breaking down some of those disparities and things that happen to us in our community that really affect us to it, it really affect Black people from getting the health care that we need and deserve. Um, and a lot of it, you know, we already know that it's systemic, but what do we need to do to break through? To What are the things we need to ask? What are the things we need to say to persist? So tonight, without further ado, let me introduce these amazing people. Uh, first of all, we have, we're going to start with the ladies, Miss Chastity Darty. She started her career as a nurse after being a research scientist for the CDC in 2006. She's worked in several areas, including medical surgery, general surgery, and women's health. As a labor and delivery nurse, as well as a doula and prenatal educator, the reduction in health disparities in minority communities is near and dear to her. After leaving women's health, she continued her career at the VA Medical Center, where she currently cares for paralyzed veterans. She completed her family nurse practitioner program in 2017 and continues to work as a clinical instructor, focusing on women's health, also maintaining her while also maintaining her dual certifications. So a little bit about inner city women's health um, remains an extremely uh, important issue or important place to test uh, she continues to her time with inner city youth in an effort to improve pre and postnatal education and awarenesses as well as reduce African American mortality rates. And if you don't know about those, you're gonna get into it because you're gonna know. Um, Mr. Cooper, Jimmy Cooper, he is a native of North Virginia with over 20 years of combined healthcare experience. He is a board certified family nurse practitioner through the American Academy of Nurse Practitioners. He served in the armed forces both as an army medic and a family nurse practitioner in the Air Force. He's been stationed all over the world caring for active duty service members and their families. His favorite duty stations were Alaska, Japan, and Guam. He is currently licensed to practice medicine in Maryland and Virginia. And after separating from the Air Force in 2017, he relocated back to the East Coast and opened Tidewater Mobile Medical, Medical Clinic, primary care clinics in Baltimore, Maryland, and Virginia. He later established Tidewater Medical Mobile Medicine PLLC, a non-emergency medical transportation career carrier. I can talk today. Providing services throughout the Hampton Roads area. He's also a special interest, uh, has a special interest in caring for underserved populations. Uh, listen, you can Google him and there's like news articles of where he's literally has saved people's lives. Um, but his primary goal is health promotion and disease prevention in his community through community outreach and efforts to bridge the gap in health care. In his leisure, he also enjoys traveling and spending time with his family. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Ms. Cassidy Buddy and Jimmy Cooper to the conversation. Yay! I know, right? Y'all are amazing people. Hey, Jeffrey. Uh, y'all, if y'all don't know, Jeffrey is amazing. So, Jeffrey, by the way, this is 
Candy Skeegee made. So now you have a face to go with the name on our Wednesday night conversations. So you guys, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation is because we deal with a lot of nonsense as it relates to healthcare, um, and you all, you all see it a lot more than you know, you know, you do those, you know, people like me on this end. And um, I think it's really unfortunate, but sometimes people, you know, like a regular person like me, if you're not aggressive and you're a bit passive, you don't know what to ask, you don't know what to do, you kind of just kind of flow with it. Um, but I think that one of the things we need people to understand is that's just not the response. That's not that's just not what you want to do um, as it relates to taking taking health care, at least your health, you know, even if it's not somebody your health into consideration and um, really taking that under control. So I want to kind of jump into it and ask you guys, what are some of the healthcare disparities that you have personally observed in the Black community as you serve in your different compa your respective capacities? Um, and I'm going to let Cassidy go first. And yes, you guys have a delay. Um, the number one health disparity that I see on a regular basis is the lack of a primary care provider. Um, somewhere between going to a pediatrician for regular visits as you transition to an adult, a lot of people in the African American community do not continue their health care. Um, the concept that the emergency room is for emergency. Right. And if you had continued your relationship with a primary care provider and transitioned into adulthood, you would have somebody who call for advice, who knows your medical history, who can be actually more informative, right. probably temporal issues a little bit faster because they know you. Right. Um and just systemically a fear of healthcare in general. That yeah. um, there has to be an alternative or ulterior motive as to why someone is telling you something. Right. It can't be fact. There, there has to be another reason. Um, and often I feel like even from the provider standpoint, um, we have been an we including me because I will not pretend that I'm not I haven't fallen victim to it myself have been indoctrinated to just look at us as not compliant mm. um instead of ignorant to certain things some things right. we are actually ignorant of. we're not being not compliant it's just nobody ever told um and, and I had talked earlier on certain things in the past. When you live in a space where it, it's not your norm, mm -hmm. it, it's kind of easy to be like, huh? You didn't know that you could just call your doctor for a same day appointment? You didn't know that? Like, you didn't know that they had a time where they would just see you? Um, but, you know, I lived in that space coming up. You didn't go to the emergency room. Okay. You called the doctor, you got a same day appointment. And you went at two o'clock, right? and I'm gonna pick you up from school and take you to the doctor at two o'clock. So, right. um, a lot of it is just a, a lack of awareness um, from the opposite side or from a different perspective. I would say. Right. I agree. I think that because I I didn't I didn't grow up going to no doctor all the time. I and and to be honest, I am a person who always thought that emergency room is literally for emergencies. Like, like it says emergency room. So I do think that, as you say that, it, I think it is definitely awareness because when you don't know, you can't operate within anything that you don't know. Um, so I think those are all valid points. Jimmy, what do you think are some of the disparities that you have um, been been witness to in, in your experiences? Well, Dr. Hughes, first off, um, my definition of health disparity is um, pretty much is there an increase in the rates of certain disease processes or illnesses or conditions amongst certain population groups. And right. um, what I've seen is everything. I can, I can recall being embarrassed in, in class. You know, every mm -hmm. topic we got on blood pressure, 
diabetes, high cholesterol, HIV AIDS, everything. It was, you know, we were at increased incidence of whatever it was. And, wow. um, you know, I think it was one or two throughout my, um, my schooling, uh, my training rather. And, you know, I, it, it was something that kind of resonated in me and I still can recall the way I felt sitting in class, just knowing I was at high risk of everything, every chapter that we turned to um, and still moving forward some 11 years later in my current role, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the high, hyperlipidemia or high, or high cholesterol, um, everything. Um, we are at increased rates, you know, and so these are the di disparities that I see. Right. Um, yes, we mentioned that there's not of a, a there's a tendency for people to not have a primary care provider. Um, however, what I've also seen is that those patients of mine who are in panel to me, I am their primary care provider. Uh, if I were to compare them to other populations, they don't have regular follow-up. In other words, follow up in three months to see me. You don't yeah. follow up. Um, and to me, you know, I'll probably get some backlash for saying this, but let a, pair, a new pair of J's come out. You're going to be in yep. the line getting some J's. Right. But you can't make it to your follow up to get your Norvas for your blood pressure medication renewed or right. to get your hemoglobin A1C repeated for your diabetes to see whether or not you are going in the right direction that I anticipate you should right. be going. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but that's that. I'm not, I'm not much of a public speaker, um, and I'll probably stutter throughout this. But, um, but that's that. A lot of help. You know, we we are at increased risk for everything. Um, right. Women, um, infant mortality, um, decreased life expectancy. Um, right. Is another, and um, so another thing um, is preventative um, mm -hmm. screenings. We don't get a lot of preventative screenings. And so what that mean is, means is that we um, we get treatment in order to avoid uh, the next disease. Step. Secondary. Yeah. yeah, so vaccinations for you. You know, right. so I'm going to get something in order to prevent a disease. And then because the screenings, when we go in to get our mammography screenings and our colorectal screenings, that's secondary. By the time we get those, we might already have a disease process, you know. Right. And of course, the last thing is tertiary. That's the treatment. We would undergo right. if we were diagnosed with the disease, and right. so yeah. I think that um, I, I I think that is <laughs> a lot of it boils down to awareness, knowing, but also practices, things that are handed down to us. Because mindset is, if I'm not sick, why do I need to go see a doctor, or why do I need a primary care, or you know, we have this fear for some reason of going to the doctor or, or, you know, approaching healthcare. So we don't deal, we don't take a proactive approach. At least I was not, I don't, I wasn't raised to have a proactive approach to my health um, or to make it a priority. Um, you know, it's like going to the dentist. You don't go see no dentist until your tooth hurt, you know, just things like that. You don't think about how everything in your body is connected um, and, Making it again, like you said, a priority. Let some J's come out every three months or every three to six months. It's a new iPhone. Folks be lined up to get that new iPhone. But like you said, they will not follow up and, you know, do those three month check ins to make sure that all is well or, you know, do the things that they need to do. So I think that. Um, it's, it's important for us to shift our mindset as a community, as it relates to health care to one address. Why are we afraid go to the doctor <laughs> like why are we afraid? i literally talked to somebody one time this was a long this was some years ago um this was somebody that i went to college with and i asked them a point blank question you know about their something that they were afraid of healthcare wise and they was like straight up i'm afraid because i'm afraid of diagnosis i was like but you're not afraid to die you're afraid of this diagnosis that could literally kill you so your answer is to not go to the doctor because so you're just going to wing it and maybe die and leave behind kids and all this other kind of stuff. So I think that there is definitely a real fear there. But how we overcome that, I believe that that's the, the challenge. And um, wh where do you believe that these misconceptions or these fears, these things that, you know, that we have in the black community, where do you think that they originate as it relates to health care? 
I think a lot could be uh, could be learned, uh, Doctor Hughes. You know, so yeah, learn behavior. Uh, yeah, l learn behavior. You know, we don't want to go to the doctor because you know, um, when granddad um, or uncle went to get his colonoscopy, they found three pops. You right. Know, so you know, it must be something that they're doing because you know, every time we go, we hear bad news. It's something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I've, I've heard that. And, you know, my treatment plans for, for patients, you know, of course, I'll, according to the preventive um, uh, maintenance or preventive medicine uh, guidelines, I'll suggest that they get certain tests at certain recommendations and they'll try to um, uh, defer certain exams because of that reason. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm fine. I don't yeah. want to get it because of this or uh, this reason. You know, my mom, she when she had her mammogram, they found a spot and I'd rather not know. Um, or if I found right. out something, it would worry me to death, you know, so I'd rather not know. Um, right. So I'm not so sure. Right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, yeah. I'm sorry. Chester, if you want to take it from there, I don't, um, as far as the misconceptions, I don't, I don't know. Um, to be honest, we have a legitimate reason historically in the background. Not yeah. necessarily us the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. Um our mother Tuskegee taught us a lot of things. Um mm -hmm. you know, the last patient that was injected with syphilis was in nineteen seventy two, I believe. Yep, the Tuskegee experiment. Um, yeah. um I born in seventy nine. So let's put that into perspective. Right. Um yeah. So there's a legitimate underlying concern that I'm gonna give you a little credit for. Mm. Right. Um but at some point there is some accountability has that has to be taken. I agree. Um we know that uh African American women are less likely to be uh receive pain medication mm -hmm. during labor. Right. Um that's a fact. That's not made up. Um, right. You know that the first cesarean were performed on African American women with no pain medication. That's a fact. Right. Not gonna pretend that doesn't exist. Um, right. Recent years, we've seen people like uh, Cassie's daughter in law die from a PE. Uh, Serena Williams spoke out about her experience with a PE and stress and how much she been, couldn't breathe. and she was having these symptoms and we ignored them. Right. I get that. You know, so there there is a legitimate reason for a concern right. or fear. But fear doesn't justify a lack of effort. Like, right. You, you still have to be proactive and fear. And if somebody isn't listening to you, or you don't feel like one doctor is listening, and you got to go to another doctor, or you got to go to another specialist, or you need to see another nurse practitioner because this one, um, knowing your body is important, and I don't feel anybody knows your body better than you. You can know this, right. is, and you have to be your biggest proponent to say something is wrong. I know that y'all ran mm -hmm. these tests and, tests and it's coming back, but. Something is wrong with me. I know this is not me. I know whatever this is, is going on with me is not normal. Correct. So to, if you have to send me to 15 people, we gonna find out what's wrong with me. Right. Um, it could come out to be, in the end, I don't care if it, it actually comes out to be a mental health diagnosis. It doesn't matter. Something is going to, if something is wrong with me, you're not going to be able to tell me that nothing's wrong. Right, right. I agree. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do with people's mindset and taking a pro approach to our health and just having a decision, like you said, accountability and making the decision to get over your fears and get over the the yes we know these things happened in the past but having the this making the decision to choose to get over it and do what you need to do for yourself um 
And even if that means finding a black doctor, I think that it's, it representation matters. And I think it, it absolutely matters who, who who provides care. And But if we don't have enough black doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, all of these different people at every stage as it relates to healthcare, it does kind of, um, you know, make you wary of, you know, who you can trust with your health. Um, I, don't, I don't know if um, Jimmy will agree with me, but I've been in nursing for 14 years and I can promise you, we listen to us less than we listen to other folks. You, I believe that. You're breaking out a little. She broke out a little bit. Wait, man, no, and, she said that. Um, she said that. Um, I, that I don't know that black patients listen to black doctors less than they would do anybody else. That Ooh. level of comfort is not there. It's almost like um, I've actually had my own tell me they would prefer someone else. Wow, faster, faster. Right, then right. I've had someone else tell me they would prefer not to have me. Wow. So we have a we do we definitely have a trust issue as it relates to believing that someone in that looks like you in the healthcare in the healthcare industry is knowledgeable and has what ha, and, and really cares more about you than somebody that doesn't look like you but yet we sit here and yeah. complain about the quality of healthcare that we receive but we don't re want to receive that that healthcare i that's that's very interesting that's very interesting what are some of the other challenges that you that you have faced in in treating or coming or or having or trying to yeah treat uh, a black patient I think it's empowering um, patients to have their own voice okay. and, to, and to be part of the healthcare team. Um, don't let me tell you your plan. You know, I want you to um, ask questions. I want you to right. um, ask alternatives, you know. Um, so tell me more about this diagnosis. You know, what, what, are the, what are my treatment options? Are there any alternatives? What are the side effects of the medication? Right. You know, and I, I, what I find is that, and again, I've taken care of patients in the military, as well as the civilian sector, big hospital systems. Now I have my own practice um, and predominantly African-American population. We don't ask a lot of questions, you know, um, at least, you know, in my practice. Um, if I say, hey, you've got diabetes and I think you should start this metformin, you know, it's usually okay. Yeah, okay, Doc, okay. Um, and, you know, I would, I used to be at, at one point when I worked in public health, a little bit more paternalistic than I am right now. You know, right. I think you should do this, do this. But, you know, I, I can appreciate someone that, you know, kind of sit, will sit down with me and we can go over, you know, the diagnosis mm -hmm. and we can talk about it. So just having a voice, you know, um, that's that's been my biggest challenge. Um, and then, of course, the right. follow up. You know, everyone annually, you should have a follow up, minimally. Right, and then you, and, and more often if you need to, you know, every three months, every six months, um, and you know, just again having that that trust that you know everything's going to be okay, and um, you know, so those those have been my biggest challenges. Right, I agree. Chastity, did you want to add to that before we move on? Um, yes, I just picked back and off of what Jimmy said. A lot of the times too. Um, we tend not to say we don't understand. Um, I'm sure right. we can relate as far as our education is concerned. They always tell you when you're talking to a patient or whatever that you should speak or try to communicate at like a fifth grade level. Don't use big words. Don't, you know what I mean? Like just try to be very famous terms with things. Right. When you ask people questions like, do you understand? Often I right. do feel like we do get a lot of, yeah, but you don't. Say I don't understand. Yeah. Um, right. You know, they print, um, I think they, I, um, and I might be, I think it's fifth grade level too for all medical uh, pamphlets. That's what they try to say as far right. as when you get personal information about medication or 
anything. Um, I don't think that they, I just don't think that we speak up and say, I don't understand. And I Correct. also have, um, in the, in the spectrum of caring for people, like you said, like with diabetes and stuff like that, I feel like culturally, we get, more than often not, we need the congratulations for where you are. So you have the diabetic patient who drinks Pepsi three times a day. Um, I'm going to congratulate you when you got down to one. You, you know what? You get an attaboy because we right. didn't lower it three times a day to one. Now, can we right. lower it to one every other day? I know that you're trying. Right. I know that this change in behavior is difficult. Um, yeah. Especially with our hypertensive and diabetic patients. Um, and Jimmy can, can chime in. Most of them live in a food desert. So we got to give you credit that you're not necessarily living somewhere or per se can afford a whole food, whereas you do have a Dollar General and mm -hmm. your hook store where you're seeking nutrients. So I'm going to give you credit that this week you actually took the meal and didn't eat a TV dinner. Like, yeah. I think it yeah. would give people more support in knowing that they're trying. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times they try a little harder. Like, my provider didn't go off with me today. I was honest and I told my girl two Pepsi last week. But that's right. two I agree. from 21 Pepsi. You drank two yeah. Pepsi last week walked in my door, you were drinking 21. So, yeah. to me, you're doing a great job. Right. I agree with you. I think that, um, I, I, now let me speak from a patient perspective. Encouragement goes a long way. And it does, it, it, it pushes you to want to continue to make those positive changes. Um, and so I, I believe that proper bedside manner and having that rapport with your patient. And like you said, I don't care if it's a baby step, it needs to be applauded because now if you just hammering and beating them down, that's not going to make anybody want to do better. So I'm darn if I do, darn if I don't, so I may as well don't. I may as well just keep drinking 40 Pepsis a week. I may as well keep, you know, sucking down honey buns and doing what I'm doing. And I'm not saying that's what people do, but I'm just saying I may as well continue eating fried foods and not exercising and doing all things that's leaving the high, that's leading to the diagnosis that I have because I'm not getting any encouragement to do so because we're trying to change somebody's mindset about lifestyle and lifestyle changes are hard to make very hard to make real talk so it doesn't matter so yeah i know my college roommate not my college one of the girls i went to college with when i tell you that girl drink the only thing she drank was mountain dew even into adulthood she drink anything other than mountain dew and i'm talking about not one a day all she drink all day is mountain dew she might switch it up with a pepsi but everything was always Mountain Dew. So when you drink Mountain Dew and that's all you drink is Mountain Dew and Pepsi, and now you 40 something years old and you gotta make lifestyle changes, that's not about to be easy. That's not an easy habit to kick. That's not an easy mindset to change to say, okay, instead of Mountain Dew or Pepsi, I'm gonna drink green tea or water. That's not easy to do. Um, so I agree with you. I think every little bit, every bit of encouragement helps. Oh, my God. Okay, I don't care if you lost three pounds. You know what? Do you know you lost three pounds between last week and this week? You lost three pounds. You know what? If you keep this up by the end of the month, you could be up to like 15 pounds lost or 12 pounds or whatever. That's encouragement because that's 10 pounds, that's 12 pounds, that's however many pounds closer to, you know, whatever goal that, that you're trying to achieve. Um, I think it makes a big difference. I, I really do. Jimmy, you wanted to say something? No, so I agree. Um, you know, empowerment is, is huge. Um, right. Setting uh, short-term realistic goals. 
you know, um, mm -hmm. not giving patient goals. You know, um, oftentimes we'll say, hey, I want you to lose 20 pounds before you come back to me in three months. I think that'll improve your blood pressure. You know, it'll help with your with your diabetes. Is that realistic? You know, um, right. can you uh, change some of those um, conditions that might have led to um, an increase in weight? You know, um, can you be more um, less sedentary or more active? You know, is it realistic for you to um, to walk three days a week? You know, my, is your schedule too busy? I can only do one day a week. I right. can't do three days a week. You know, financially, I can't afford to eat more um, healthier foods. You know, this is what I have. Um, right. You know, so so things like that. Um, so definitely empowering and rewarding. Uh, you know, even small, small gains, like you said. You know, and then um, right. kind of trying to pinpoint what level of change they're in. You know, so do they want to right. change? Is there a willingness and a readiness to change? Smoking cessation. Right. If you don't want to smoke. You know, I can beat a dead horse all day long. Um, but right. You know, it's you're not going to probably be successful if you don't want to start, you know, to stop, you know, um, I similar, agree. similarly diet, exercise, um, alcoholism, you know, all of those, you know, habits, you know, it's going to be pretty hard to change those if you're, you know, if you're in a predicament where you don't want to change. So you may have to explore, you know, things that might be um, contributing to the need to want to. And like you said, it could be an underlying mental health issue that might be mm -hmm. increasing their likelihood of, you know, um, having such habits, you know, um, right. because of this, I drink because of this, my diet is because of this, I eat when I'm happy, I eat when I'm sad, you know, and so, um, and that's a whole nother topic right there um, that we previously mentioned, right. the mental health uh, topic. Right. It is. I think that um, I, I want to go back to something Chastity hit because this is an issue for me. Um, people having access to quality, healthy foods. And when I say have access to it, it needs to not only be within your neighborhood, it needs to be affordable. I think it's absolutely ridiculous that it costs more for healthier foods than to eat fast food all the time or to have access to you know a hungry man dinner compared to you know i don't care if it's healthy choice or whatever i think that it's ridiculous that it's so hard for black communities especially to have um, access to fresh vegetables for instance and i remember reading something about a, a black community that um, they had some empty space and they they planted an herb garden like a, they had a whole garden and uh, the city came along and instead of encouraging them and, and giving them the permits and all the stuff they needed, they destroyed that garden and said that it was out of it, that they weren't authorized to do it. It was just, it's their land. It was their space and destroyed that garden. And so it's like, okay, what is the purpose behind some of the things that are happening that we can't have access to quality, affordable, healthy food? Like you said, it might be, you can find a family dollar, dollar general, any type of these, you know, kind of stores where people, you know, will go and buy used for groceries, but you got to go 30, 40 miles to find a health, uh, a healthy uh, store where you can get fresh vegetables or even a produce stand or a farmer's market. So I think that there is some challenge there between trying to help people make lifestyle choices and being able to bridge that gap between the choices that I need to make and having access to the things that I need for those choices. And I think that that's, that's a huge part of it. Sometimes, you know, if, if, if you have a patient that they don't know what to do and you start telling them, okay, I want you to lose 20 pounds by the time you come back to me in three months, here are some things that you can do and I can make suggestions. Okay, but if you make those suggestions, but people don't have access, to the suggestions what do we do so like for the longest time back in the day okay i stopped eating canned food a long time ago canned vegetables have a lot of preservatives and salt and all that stuff so i went to fresh frozen i'm 
because I might not be able to get canned foods, but I know in the frozen food section, I can get vegetables. Little things like that can help people go a long way because now you can go in the Dollar Tree, Family Dollar, Dollar General, and they all have those frozen sections. And they may not be the best of the best, but you know you can at least get some broccoli. You can get cauliflower. You can get, you know what I mean? You can get some vegetables to be able to make some better decisions. But how then do we, I, I don't know how we can help people get access to this kind of stuff to help them make these better decisions. That's the hard part. And how do we, how do we get the powers that be to, you know, to encourage better grocery stores, for instance, in our communities, rather than again, if it, you got to go 20, 30 miles to find a grocery store, a farmer's market. If it's good for this neighborhood over here, why is it not good for a black neighborhood? Um, the research scientist and me first is gonna come up before the healthcare professional. Um, mm -hmm. we have to look into things statistically, and based on statistical buying pattern, mm -hmm. you're gonna get certain things. Right. Um, on top of that, we do have to touch a little bit on the political. Mm -hmm. And say that based on funding, incentives, tax breaks, tax, yeah. et cetera, um, certain stores are going to uh, benefit more being in a certain area. So right. not on a negative, not 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 even in a negative space. Just remember. I think all of us on the screen are old enough to remember when Walmart was really blowing up. Um, mm -hmm. Walmart was always in a rural area. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it took yes, it out, was. The complaint was it took out the mom and pop. It took out the this and the that. But it was always mm -hmm. more positioned in a rural area because it was going to present one-stop shop. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the city... There were more plazas and there were more things. So you could go to a plaza, go to the grocery store and get your, you know what I'm saying? You could go get your toilet seat yeah. from another store. But statistically, Walmart started in rural areas. Yep. And it was more to provide a one-stop shopping type deal. And they knew that based on the demographic around them. So Correct. to put a whole food um or a trader joe's i'm 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 reaching here a whole foods or a trader joe's or a fresh market you know, a fresh market or a world uh, a world market or strawberry those uh mm -hmm. more higher end grocery store in a demographic where the average income is 25k or 30k there you go mm -hmm. it's not gonna be an official per se Right to the operator of the store, like right. let's be 100, everything is based on profit, we money, live in a profitable society. Now, right. as for what we're talking about, absolutely, it, it would be great to be able to send our patients that we are concerned about our inner city patients to those types of stores, but on a demographic. Right level it it's not economic for the person putting the story they're okay. not getting the break they're not getting um the benefit and the profit margin is going to be extremely low yeah. because you're yeah. still not going to get people um to think outside of the box you know uh yeah. i live in a space where my children eat all vegetables my children pretty much ate only vegetables for the first year of their life before I introduced fruit. Because right. I wanted them to think sweet potatoes was and but it was as sweet as it got. That was just for me to prepare their palate that I could cook asparagus today or squash today 
Right. And those have a little bit of sugar, some some peas, and and they got a sweet flavor. But I also know that I'm right. rare. You know, I know that I'm rare in that thought process. Right. It's a lot cheaper to buy, you know, canned peaches or whatever it is. And it is it is healthier than them eating flaming hot chips, but it's yeah. still not necessarily the, the healthiest of options. Um, but like Jimmy said earlier, it's funny that you can find transportation to get to the mall to buy a pair of Robin jeans, but you can't find transportation to get to Whole Foods. That's right down the street from the same mall. You bought the Robin jeans even. So you have to decide what your priorities are. And we live mm-hmm. in a very, we will always be a consumer until we decide yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Being the distributor is a much better option. I agree. And that's with any and everything. And it helps us the hardest. Um, hardest. In the last four years, I've lost three friends to colon cancer. I'm 41. I'm yeah. 41. Yeah, we don't even screen mm-hmm. for colon cancer until fifty. But what were I we was doing? Shocked when I when I saw when I saw what happened to Jake, I was like, "We talking about the same that went to Skiki? What happened? How right. in the world cancer?" So, so, that, that that threw me off, and I looked at my age, and I was like, "How? It's amazing." So it. something about the dynamic is off because the yeah. the annual the, the annual screening for colon cancer doesn't even start till fifty. So, me, myself, I was a proponent of some things with me, myself. So, I got a colonoscopy at 38. Right. But that's me knowing how to be on people's neck. Like, this ain't right. On the, same, on the same spectrum, if a provider, and Jimmy, you can, like, like if a provider was like, well, you too young for me to do a colon screening, it wouldn't even be a lie. It, it, like if you come into my office at 35 with bowel issues, I'm gonna probably go to diet first. I'm not gonna lie to you. What are you eating? What are you consuming? How much alcohol are you drinking? Are you smoking? Right. Like I'm probably gonna go more to lifestyle than being right. like, let's see you for a colonoscopy. Right, yeah. I'm probably yeah. gonna try out something first, but you know. Yeah. Reflux, reflux disease, for example. Um, I'm probably gonna treat it with some form of diet modifications, maybe a medication, and say, come back in three months. Again, I'm looking forward right. to that, it's gonna come back in three months. Because like you said, um, Chester, you only you know your body, and you know when something's wrong. And at that point, I might refer you to see a gastroenterologist or a GI mm-hmm. doctor who might then, in turn, you know, give you a endoscopy or a tube down your throat or a colonoscopy, you know, the other end to make sure you don't have some form of cancer or polyps um but again that right. follow up follow up follow up yeah. i agree um ashley says when i have my patients i don't add stuff to my patients diet i start with removing items out of their diet first um i think that that might help with changing people's mindset about lifestyle changes um to show them what they can substitute like when my last doctor she didn't she didn't add stuff to my diet what she did say was instead of eating this so she asked me what i ate it's not that i had a bad diet but it was like she looked for opportunities to substitute something better for what i was eating so she would say okay i know you like this you have a lot of green in your vegetables i want to get some other colors in there so instead of this how about substituting this particular green vegetable for this let's try it so she would find ways to help me substitute other things that i could eat to improve my overall health it wasn't that i ate trash it was just i have very one tone one note like 
these green vegetables and I'm going to get my greens in. But I needed carrots. I needed to add carrots to my diet. I needed cauliflower. I needed, you know what I mean, Brussels sprouts, even though they're green. It's a different type of, you know, it was something other than eating green beans and spinach all the time. Throwing in, like you said, asparagus, using sweet potatoes instead of white potatoes. I wasn't a big white potato person anyway. But knowing how to substitute different color vegetables and different things into your diet. So instead of literally take adding to the diet, um, what could she substitute in my diet to take it away to help me make those lifestyle changes? Because some people genuinely don't know what to do. And some people know they have an idea, but they can't think outside of what they're, I got a system, this is how I eat, and they stick to that. And there's no changing that because they don't have that mindset to come up out of that because that's not their, that's not their forte. So they need that help, encouragement to say, okay, this is what you like to eat. How about this? Or try preparing it differently so giving patients different options but i think that one of the worst things we could do is tie money to health care and that's what we do in this country specifically everything is tied to money pretty much the problem is though ironically those that have the least amount of money don't know how much more of an access that they have mm -hmm. you know i i i think that is the problem i have mm -hmm. to pay to go to the doctor I have to pay a copay. Somebody handed you a, a card, and whoever you want to go to, whether you went to the emergency room, most Medicaid doesn't require a, a referral. If you got on Google and said my stomach hurts and I want to go see a GI doctor or whatever the case may be, you could take your card and go and go for free. Wow! And whatever prescription he writes. No matter where he sends it, you're going to get it for free. Wow. Can I we handed out a now? lot of cards. We handed out a say, lot Jimmy? of cards. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. You can tell how to use it. I, I think so. What'd you say? Go ahead, Jimmy. Go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, Chastity. There was a, a pause, a delay. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. No, what she was saying was, um, you know, when people have Medicaid, I think it's Medicaid, right? Um, yeah. They can go and take that card and go. There's, they don't have pretty much any restrictions, and it'll be covered. Yeah, yeah. I agree. You know, sometimes there's a dollar co-payment, maybe two. Right, uh, but that's can, nothing compared to thirty, forty, fifty dollars, a hundred dollar copay, yeah. and then you can only go to somebody in your network and all this other kind of stuff. You got restrictions. Well, listen, like well, I have to pay. I grew up. I pay for my too. insurance, so and I'm restricted. Too. I grew up on Medicaid. Low in, low socioeconomic status, um, right? And never thought twice about um, the provider who pays his or her bills off of the number of patient encounters during the day. Wow! Now for commercial insurance, and I'm probably gonna step on some toes here. I can charge a twenty five dollar copayment if you miss, because in order to pay my bills, I need to have ten or fifteen patients a day. Right. right. Where there's no type of, um, uh, there's no nothing if uh, if five Medicaid patients in your schedule for that day happen to just not show up. And so, and that happens quite often. So we'll book, mm. you know, I'm there to do what I need to do to take care of them. And then you just don't show up, you know? So um, yeah. like, as you said, there is a certain degree of, you know, you are, um, it's a blessing, you know? So, uh, so to a certain extent, you do have a, a leg up on those um, even with commercial health insurance and certainly those without insurance. Um, wow. yeah, so. I'll tell you on my perspective, my mother was an educator. So mm -hmm. I grew up on Kaiser. And okay. what we were gonna do was go to nobody's emergency home, mm -hmm. but she wasn't paying that hundred dollar copay, period. If your leg was not falling off, it was not happening. Right. Um, you know, like I said, I grew up knowing the concept of a same day visit. I believe you, boo. You got a fever. You don't feel well. I'm about to call Dr. Likely and I'm going to get you in on her same day time. Because what we're not doing is going to the emergency room because what I'm not doing is paying that $100 copay. Right. 
Right. So for me, it was difficult transitioning because I was like, I didn't go to the emergency room for nothing. You know, I literally was being fast at 16 and hopped on the back of somebody's bike and got a tailpipe burn. And guess what? I went to the doctor the next day. Because what my mama wasn't about to do was pay no money out of pocket. Yeah. So, that, that was just the opposite. Like you had to have a gas in your forehead to go to the doctor because we were afraid of getting a bill. Right. You know, and that's what it's all about. And so I didn't start getting regular preventive medicine um, exams until I joined the military at 17. Wow. Where it was, where it was forced upon us, you know. Right. You have to get your exam. You have to get your, your vision exam. You have to get your dental exam. And that felt weird to me to, to even do it then. You know, I felt yeah. like something to be wrong. I needed to have yeah. a pain and an ache. But, and I wow. Think, I, I can remember a lot of government programs that went away too, though, that promoted primary care, including like dentistry and stuff like that that went away um you know growing up in the inner city they would send a letter home saying that the dentist is gonna come or the dental assistant is gonna come and they're gonna do swish and put the dye in your mouth you're gonna sit around and look for cavities and um you know supposed to be in a certain income bracket and uh my mother would be like well you go to the dentist twice a year you don't you 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 don't need to do but those programs, right. programs initiated the two six months because those programs came to you know came to school twice a year to remind you yeah. to your baby for the clean cleaning. Um somewhere along the line something got like something got shifted and we got too proud you know, I, I i don't know whether we got too proud because i don't you know you use the healthcare system that you need to use right um uh, jimmy can per, uh relate more being in private practice to the payment system and how everything has to be coded and this that and the third but the disparity in my opinion and i can be wrong it's not a lack of access Mm -hmm. It's more of a lack of choice to use said act. Okay. So I think you know it's almost like church. You know, there's a church on every corner. There's yeah. pretty much a clinic, a low income clinic. There's something in every city set up for you to have access. So it's not a disparity to on access. We don't live in mm -hmm. rural areas. Yeah, um, and me, me being in Ohio, there's a disparity because the majority of Ohio is rural. So there are pockets where they are traveling maybe 50, 100 miles to a major city to access. But in any of our major cities, Cleveland, Columbus, Akron, Canton, it's not a, it's not a disparity based on access. The access mm -hmm. is there or, or not. Using, using it, it. I think it's, it's knowing how to navigate too, you know, um, and I think we can do better. Um, and I'm gonna take some blame on um, being more resourceful and educating patients on the community resources out there um, that they can access in order to, you know, um, guide them in the right directions. For right. example, um, you know, your SNAP programs, you know, um, food stamps, that, that sort of thing. Getting connected with organizations who can help with um, tapping into the Medicaid, um, you know, system. Because I've got a lot of patients right. who I'll take on and, you know, um, I'll treat them pro bono just because I know that they're out of their blood pressure medications, for example, and I'm not expecting anything in return. However, you know, six months down the line, you know, with some good um, resources they might have tapped into someone a social worker or a community um, partner that might be able to help them to fill out an application to get Medicaid and at some point when they follow back up I'm getting reimbursed Good. you know so um, you know while there may not be a huge access to care issue I think that sometimes um, the familiarity with you know um, resources in the community might 
facilitate that process and access it. Uh, yeah. So I think partnerships are huge, are huge deal with with providing people with what they need. I know that um, I'm a huge proponent of Feeding America because um, just as just as somebody who partners with Feeding South Florida, I see you know, the food that gets distributed. There's lots of fresh vegetables and, you know, di different things like that that people can have access to. But again, it's like you said, um, providing that access, giving them the access to know what's available and knowing what partner agencies are in your community to be able to get that food um, that's available to you. I think that's part of it, part of it. But again, it's a mindset shift. How do we convince the black community to make lifestyle choices, but more importantly, change our mind to trust healthcare. So if you're going into the doctor and you not trusting somebody that looks like you, that's that's a problem in and of itself. We're not even talking about colorism. It's just somehow in your mind, Willie, you have you you have Willie Lynch syndrome that black is inferior. And so now instead of going with somebody, a black doctor or a black nurse or whomever, I want somebody else, but then you get upset with the care or the diagnosis you get. So, you know, having like like you're saying, both of you have pretty much said you would rather patients who would be more aggressive and have you know, more of a say in their health, but it's like it's a defense. I think I think some of it's a defense mechanism, and I think we are more. Um, me myself, as far as when I was, even when I was in labor and delivery and working with younger, and I worked in the inner city facility, inner city community hospital. Um, Ninety-eight percent of our patients were black. Uh, um we can be a little bit more direct and depending on um your outlook you can take that as we're being too hard but the reality is i'm telling you and we tend not to coddle um as providers and sugarcoat um i can give you all the encouragement in the world but in this moment and in this time, what you need is the facts and the reality. The reality is your behavior is why. Mm -hmm. Your outcome is going to be what it is. I can't hold your hand to this. You telling me, um, uh, and even with my, you know, working at the VA, I work with more Caucasian males, you know, more case, more, I, I, I interact with more Caucasian patients. It doesn't change the conversation. The reality right. is this. Your leg is going to die. Um, we can jump rope around it. We can right. play double dutch with it. We can do whatever we want to do with it, but at the end of the day, this is the reality. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of times, in general, some of us need to be coddled and as providers in of care, we don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I can't, ma'am, your A1C is 17. Normal is five to seven. Like, what do How you want? How you still alive with a 17 A1C? I, I'm just throwing out a number, but like, yeah. How else are we gonna have this conversation, ma'am? Right. The goal is five to seven. You at seventeen. Like yeah. I can't make that, that point. Point. I can't lot. make that sound good for you. Ma'am, yeah. your regular blood sugar is three hundred. You waking up out your sleep with a blood sugar of three hundred. We want you to be yeah. between sixty and a hundred. Like I can't sugarcoat that for you, ma'am. Yeah. There, I I I don't know any other way to tell you that this is ridiculous at this point. And right. probably by the time that your A1C got to 17 and then you'll say it, you came in 2017, you didn't do your follow-up in, in, in six months, you didn't you do the last follow-up, you showed up in 2018, which should have been your ninth follow-up, and now we at the point where I was trying to start you on metformin, we now need to give you Lantis, and regular, and you got to check your blood sugar, probably insulin shots, 
and be miserable. And at this point, it's not on me, ma'am. I tried right. to get it three years ago. Right, right, right. I think, but it's 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 trying to get black people to again prioritize our health care because we will prioritize everything else. We'll spend money. Uh, we got money for what we want to have money for. Let me just let's go on go on to say we've already said it. People out here getting a new iPhone every three to six months, new J's, new this, crying over the Gucci store uh, burning down or, or getting looted, and you can fit nothing in the Gucci. Or, or you know what I mean, like being ridiculous about all of these brands. So if you got a thousand dollars for a pocketbook, baby, do you know how many doctors visits and medicine and healthcare and stuff that is? It so I think mindset shift, prioritizing, and um, you know, my uh, one of my mentors here is a home health care. One of the things that she was dealing with was. Um, nurses trying to hire you know some aides and everything but what she was finding that these young girls was ending up with ostomy bags because you out here popping bottles and doing this and doing that because not understanding that your lifestyle choices you're not eating right and is you know is you doing three and four bottles a night twice a week every week and now you know your kid is gone or whatever the case may be. You got an ostomy bag. You got this. You have that. And you know you're real. And you're 20, You're not even thirty yet. Dealing with some of these lifestyle choices and not understanding how we're not prioritizing our health care because of other things that we would rather do, other lifestyle choices. And so shifting that perspective of prioritizing our health and, um, you know, again, you got money for what you got money for. Like you said, you can you can find a way to the mall. You If you can find your way to the mall to buy that Gucci bag, you can find your way to the Whole Foods that's right next door. Or, or in that same neighborhood. So I, it's it's kind of the challenge of how do we shift our mindset as a community to make our healthcare a priority because we have access. It's obvious that we have access to it, but using what we have access to. If you got Medicaid, I, 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 must, I honestly didn't know that you could get all that with it. I really didn't. I'm over here paying and mad because I got... I, if, if I go see somebody that's out of my network, it's more money. So I'm already paying for my health care. But if I want to go to a doctor that's out of the network, I got to pay more money. I got I got to pay more. But if you got a card, you can go anywhere that you want and it's free and your medicine is free or you got a $2 copay. I wish I could. Because that's really different. So there's really no excuse. But again, what we're talking about now is a mindset shift. Jeffrey said something earlier. Um, Jamal said that he has all black doctors, right? But he will not fill his prescription in the black neighborhood. A lot of the times black neighborhoods tend not to. I'm not going to like no shade. Um, it. Depending on what it is you're less likely to find it like if it's a uh, um you know some providers um are strict about what they provide you know what they prescribe so um like my my primary care provider is from the the school of he does not prescribe certain things generic you're never going to get a generic um warfarin from him He's going right. to like the prescription is going to say Coumadin because he wants to know exactly what the additive is in it, and he wants it to be one hundred percent Coumadin. Like he's right. old school right. like that. Like that's the space that he lives in. Right. So it may be an issue where neighborhood is used to providing the generic for a prescription. Mm -hmm. So if you know that the provider is adamant that it has to be the brand name you may bump into that or you know it may be a couple of days before they can get it because they're used to right. um, a generic um so that can be it sometimes and sometimes too you have to put into perspective like you said if the majority of the community is taking metformin 
um, because the majority of the community, like the number one thing constantly going to those particular drug stores are your diabetic hypertension medication. Right. Um, there may be a delay because everybody it, is taking Lasix. Everybody is taking regular and everybody needs metformin of some degree. Everybody needs they have the that like everybody needs the same right. med. So where you can yeah. go up the street to you know what I'm saying more um more missed communities, you're gonna get it the same day or they're gonna tell you it's gonna be in 30 minutes. Gotcha. Right. There may be a, a thing because of demand in right. in that community. Like cause those those are the same prescriptions that are constantly being filled. Um, filled. So yeah. you know, if you literally waited to the last day and you like need your blood pressure medication tomorrow morning, you want to have tomorrow's dose, then I could I could understand that. Right. I think that, again, that goes along with what we're talking about, those disparities, because if there are, you know, in the black community, we know that, you know, like Jay Pan, you know, in his studies, just about everything in the books, black people had high, you know, high rates. We were, you know, we're, we're high risk for a lot of these things. We carry that gene, you know? carry that gene y'all know that. The majority right. of us carry the hypertensive gene, right? right? The ones of us that survive the trend, the transformation and the, you know, transition across the water, most of us carry a hypertensive drink gene. We had to go without water, so our bodies adjusted to not needing water. So therefore, we hold on to salt, which leads right. to us having a medical predisposition. Yeah, uh, a medical predisposition to hypertension, and then. On top of that, having a diet for most of us that is high fat, high sodium. Correct. We kind of shot ourselves in the foot from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it's up to us to make the decision to say, oh, okay, that was then, this is now. Mm -hmm. We yeah. can enjoy grilled chicken just as much as we enjoy fried chicken. Right. Um, we can cook collard greens with turkey instead of pork uh, and hog, you know what I'm saying, without fat back. Like, we can make a judgment. Listen, listen, I throw down with that smoked turkey. They already know. He smoked already turkey know. Smoked turkey. Smoked turkey is my thing, too. But, I mean, you can make a judgment, and it doesn't have to be so dramatic. You're not taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a definitely a mindset because there's definitely a relationship between how we eat, our relationship with food, and you know our overall health. And like you said, if we're already predisposed to certain things, I think that one of the things that um, Jay hit on it earlier when he talked about, you know, really telling, you know, educating, awareness, making people aware of what they can do to improve their overall health. Yes. You know, Chastity, what you said, you, you, there has to be an accountability. People have to want to make the decisions necessary to change. But I think w if we continue to build awareness and putting these things out in front of people, um, you know, we'll find... Um, we'll find that there's we'll find those differences and we'll find a way to be able to get better and do better and, and make some things happen uh, but it's just a matter of how can we how can we do that you know what i mean and and be able to say okay like you said you don't have to use pork you can or you don't have to eat fried chicken every day but also celebrating those small victories. You know, when I lost 20 pounds, I was celebrating that for like four months. I don't care what nobody said. You can tell me nothing that I lost 20 pounds. In, and, and I celebrated them 20 pounds for four months. Why? Because I, it was hard getting them 20 pounds off. Okay? But getting that encouragement from my trainer and my doctor, man, that shot me through the roof. So now I'm going like, okay, how can I go harder? How can I do this? What do I need to do this? But 
Does that mean that other people will have that same motivation? No, but having awareness and being accountable and saying, okay, I don't want to live like this. Like you said, if you got a patient that's waking up with a blood sugar of 300 and you tried to fix it three years ago, why do we wait until things are drastic before we do anything? You know, why do we wait till it gets so bad that, okay, now we got gout real bad and, you know, we might have to cut off a limb because, you know, we waited so long. I don't know what it's going to take to improve that mindset that we have because we have access to affordable care, um, you know, but I mean, the resources are there. But I don't know if there's a way for us to, I guess, um, expand that awareness. You know what I mean? I don't know what we can do to help bridge that gap between mindset and getting people to decide to be accountable. I don't know. Come on, Jimmy, chime in on this one. How we gonna how we gonna fix them? Okay, you know, people. That's that's a hard question, to be honest. I'm not so sure there's an easy answer. There may be, but right. I'm, not good, I'm not good with the political uh, sector. You know, and I think we're going to have to like tap into some type of political arena, you know, either at the federal, state or local levels, you know, like all of them have to marry and, you know, to make things happen. You know, um, do we need more monies? I'm not so sure how to get the more monies. Right. Um, do we need um, to, you know, everyone to talk, you know, maybe the um, the state or federal government is not you know, allocating certain resources to the health department in, you know, my locality versus the locality to cities over, I, I don't know. Right. You know, um, so social uh, determinants, you know, like um, in health inequalities, you know, are we dividing resources equally? I, I don't know. Right. You know, and that would be a political thing, something that someone would do some, um, some measurements and I don't, I'm not sure how to measure those those health, health outcomes. Right. I think part of it, too, is also, you know, enough of us need to complete the census. We don't. And so we don't get our fair share sometimes in some communities, because if if this community fills out, if 40 percent of this community fills out the census, but they need more of the money and 80 percent of this community fills it out. That community that really don't need that money as much is going to get the money that this community needs because they're not filling out the census. So we don't know the population and what that population needs. So I I, I think that when it comes to money and, and getting your fair share of, of, of money from you know government funding, that's a big piece of it. I think another piece of it is too is um, this came out in the conversation. It came out in education panel. It came out in the uh, political panel and it's coming out here. Money should not be tied to cities getting what they need as far as, you know, a lot of the stuff that's happening to be able to get the programs and the stuff that you need. It should not be about money. And when I say about money, meaning political. And it, it really is. And it's unfortunate that, okay, I got more money, so my money's talking over here. I'm in Florida, so I already know. When it came to Palm Beach County reopening compared to Broward and Miami Dade, and I'm thinking to myself, y'all got the most COVID positive cases, but y'all reopening petition to open because folks with money wanted to reopen. So their money spoke. And there's some challenges there because how is that helping the community at all? So I think that... Um, you know, I have issue with how 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 money is distributed to community programs. But again, building awareness, I think there's definitely a way to build awareness, but just being able to find those organizations like you got Feeding America um, that, you know, providers can partner with to be able to tell their patients, for instance, that, okay, if you can't get access to healthy foods, here is your a list of local uh, partner agencies of Feeding America, and this is how you can get free food because it's free. You just go and you, well, right now it's drive through service. You go and go to drive through service. You pop your trunk and you put that food in there. Ooh. 
Um, I hate that. I don't even know what to say. Like certain things are just sometimes just like way beating a dead horse. Because I feel yeah. like the people that have the most resources are the people less likely to use those resources. And that's just been my experience being in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, and also from a certain perspective, these are just, um, you know, some yeah. stereotypes of, or expectations of a certain patient. Unfortunately, too often, uh, I hate to say it, they, they be true. So, like, you can't, um, don't at me. I, I mean, it, it is what it is. It just means, say it. Just say it. They need to hear it. Everybody, just say it. Like, it's just, like, no matter how much that you try to be the pro- proponent for, like, no, like, and you could be the biggest cheerleader. All too often, exactly what you saw in the paper when the patient arrived, like in just looking at the history, and then you have a conversation. Unfortunately, too often, it's precisely what you're going to get. It's um, it's sad, but it's true, and I. I hate that it's that way. I really do, but it's it's so difficult to because I can't expect my white counterpart to think outside of the box when every time they see a certain patient, they get the same thing. Like you just gave them everything they needed to treat you a certain kind of way, and there's nothing I can do because at that point you get frustrated. Like look at for anybody, you get frustrated. Um, right. You know, we talk about fetal mater- uh, uh, our mortality rates with children and moms and the things that they go through. You don't know how many conversations I have with women. Like, stop trying to get induced. Your baby will come when it comes. Like, be easy. Unless there is no, unless there is a legitimate reason. For this position to induce you, stop asking. That's not how yeah. the body works. Be yeah. easy. You miserable. Been here, done that. I had my first son, I carried for 42 weeks. You know how mad I was and did not want to be pregnant anymore? Right. He came out grass. And I was actually seeking to be induced, but he came out just as healthy as a will. Right. I twins and healthcare or not healthcare, all I wanted to do was take them home with me. They came early. Right. The discussion wasn't about and we cut me drug like it was healthy baby. It's like right. so many of us that have this glamorous aspect of being pregnant or what it means to but oh just cut me. Why? You know what they gotta do? Get that baby out of there. You know, all the stuff they move out. You do realize that's make your surgery, right? You do realize that you've increased your health risk, right? You do understand you're more likely to cry, right? You, you like you don't understand that there is more complications that are involved with that, right? Like and they looking at me like I'm a deer with my hand cut off. Well, he said that he was gonna induce me at 38 weeks. Why? Give me a legitimate reason why, and I might agree. But right. this is where our numbers fall because then you have providers that are listening to you whine, moan, complain, come, act a fool, do all of these things. And those same providers, when you tell them you can't feel your left toe, ain't thought that you just might have a DVT now. They haven't thought that. The fact that you have a difficulty breathing is related to a blood clot or air embolism that went somewhere post surgery. Right. They looking at you like, girl, you had a baby. Get over it. Right. We more likely to send a baby home without a mother. But Mm -hmm. when I say something to you, or when other providers say something to you, oh, you just being mean. You don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. 
Right. I'm trying to save That's your life right here. <laughs> yeah. It's not peaches and cream, apples and roll. You know, it's, and I'm not a per, I'm not opposed to anesthesia of any kind. I'm not. If you want an epidural, you want some new bags. They use Demerol at your facility. Whatever the case, I'm not saying it's got to be painless. But somebody should have told you a realistic story. Right. Like, labor is pain with a reward. A baby. A healthy one. Right. That's right. the one time in life the pain is worth the reward. Is how right. I look at it. Right. So... Then you, we just saw in the last three weeks, I think it was three young ladies, two in New York, one in New Jersey, all passed away, 26 and under. Yeah. That the baby went home without a mother. Mm-hmm. And they don't care. That's they they don't care. And it's this that's the that's the issue with a lot of the mortality rates, especially as it relates to black women. And we say, listen, believe these women when they say X, Y, Z. We saw it, like you said, with Serena. She had blood clots in her and she she persisted. How many patients don't persist? How many like 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 they were saying? I wish my patients were more, you know, vocal, more took a more active role in their health because, you know, it helps me help you. But we're too passive when it comes to our health, rather than saying because like my doctor tell me she want to put me on some why? What is this medication? What is it supposed to do? What are the side effects? Are there any alternatives? Because I'm not trying to pop pills my whole life. I was born anemic. Guess what? I ain't trying to take iron pills my whole life. So what can I do to substitute for this pill? I don't care how small that pill is. It's a pill. I don't want to do it. The other way around. And that's what we don't get. You set yourself up for a situation where no matter how much pain you're in, you're going to have a lot of providers telling you You'll be all right. They gonna right. try to get you to take some Tylenol. Like and Tylenol ain't gonna fix that. It's I not. can't breathe. I can't breathe, ma'am. What I'm saying is I can't breathe. Like, but they gonna take take some Tylenol because you can't breathe. What is Tylenol gonna do for breathing? But and these are some of the things that. But these are these are some of the misdiagnosis. And maybe I'm not using the right term, but this is some of the misdiagnosis that's out there that's leading me to, you know, we saw, um, what's the young lady, uh, uh, P. Diddy's um, ex, when she died and she had pneumonia, they had just diagnosed her with flu and she called and said, I don't feel good, something is wrong. And they told her to take some Tylenol and come back and that girl didn't make it and ended up with pneumonia and died. But she knew she wasn't feeling what she knew something was wrong. She knew it was more than that. And they were talking about, oh, you just got such, 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 such. Since we set ourselves up for that, though, that's where, like, like Jimmy can probably, like, you set, we almost set yourself up for that. Because you was the patient that came in here, why, why, all the time. Like, I, what you not going to do all the time. So, yeah. um, can't tell you nothing that <laughs> because you know it's true. Like at some point, you get tired as a provider. Like well, you gonna tell me, I'm gonna tell you because you ain't gonna no, tell look, I'm me. Not agree with that now. Right. Like that's what happened. So, like I said, unfortunately, I sat in that bubble where you like you just display everything that I just was like. That's not the case. Mm-hmm. No. See, no. Mm-mm. See that. See, that is not true how they be. And then out of 10 patients, seven of y'all just showed up and did everything that said was going to happen. Now, I don't, I don't even have no defense. Right. I don't have no defense. Yeah, it's crazy. They so, uh, came up here and showed out. So guess what? I guess statistically. Like, and now you become a statistic. That's true. And it's unfortunate, but that it does happen. Jay, jump in here before we close out for tonight, sir. Y'all quiet. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, press my bedtime. I know um, you've been working all day. I'm gonna get you off of here. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, we are 
at a disadvantage of a, of a, as a people. Right. You know, and I think, you know, this is a, um, it's multifactorial what we can do in order to change things that might lead to efforts to, you know, lead to he healthier lifestyles. You know, right. It, all, it starts with all of us. You know, first off, we need to recognize, hey, look, we do have disproportionate, you know, risk of having every disease process out there. You know, um, again, going back to school, you know, I, and Chesley, I'm sure you can attest to that too. You're sitting in class with other races and ethnicities and you're just, okay, you're raising your hand, you know? Um, right. You know, what can we do in order to um, lessen the burden on our right. community? That's a question that we should ask ourselves. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, if they're, like you said, uh, Dr. Hughes, if you can, you know, tap into the political arena, you know, making sure you fill out your census, uh, visit your local health department. You know, if you have mm -hmm. a patient or you know a friend, a neighbor or someone who uh, seemingly is struggling with, with health care, you know, you, you think they might not be um, tapped into a doctor or health department, a clinician, you know, if you'll point them in the right direction. Um, if you know someone that may not be able to afford medications and, you know, you hear complaints of it, you know, if you'll point them to the health department, to a free clinic, because oftentimes some people will just go without care because of, you know, just either not knowing that there's free options or um, because of fear, like we said, you know, earlier. So, and I'm just rambling right now, but, you know, but I will say I do a very good job at taking care of my patients over at TMM Medical Clinic in Chesapeake, Virginia. Amen. And, <laughs> and Put that plug in uh, there because I was so good. Good plug, good plug. Come yeah, on. Uh, like I told we're going to tell you to put it in there. <laughs> yeah, but um, there, there are struggles. And, right. um, you know, I, I try my hardest to um, make sure that patients are feel like they have a um, – I'll say in that care because it, that's 100% true. And only thing I can ask is that, you know, we respect each other. You know, um, I'm going to keep you healthy. You know, um, you know, you you are um, not careless with my time. You know, when we come in, we're about business. You know, we my job is to keep you healthy, right. you know, and um, and follow up, you know, follow through, follow through, follow through. And let's make this a collective effort that, you know, making our community because we're all we're just a we're as strong as our weakest person or our mo most unhealthiest person. That's yeah. right. Yeah. No, you're as strong as the weakest link. That's yeah, right. there you go. I agree. Chastity, leave the people with something. What you working on? I'm <laughs> not working on anything. <laughs> <laughs> working on taking my, my own personal board. Right. <laughs> That's what I'm working on. Um, take my own board. But, um, be open-minded and listen. That's my that's my only thing that I have to tell anybody. Um, understand that not everything is uh, hating, and that's it. Just in general, some things are just a general statement in an effort to make things better for you. Correct. Um, okay. As a as a, someone who is a healthcare provider. Um, me giving you advice or me giving you a suggestion doesn't benefit me. It benefits you. The goal is to benefit you. Um, to gain another day above ground, because that's better than one underneath. That's so, right. So, um, listen, seek advice if you need to. Um, I'm pretty sure Jimmy can attest to being in nursing. It doesn't even matter if you just reaching out to that family member that is a nurse, even though we get tired of it. Right. You can reach out and we can send you somewhere that is, um, you know, appropriate and give you the advice accordingly and ask questions. If you don't have a clear understanding, please don't say, okay. If you don't understand what the provider did to you, if you don't understand the recommendation, if you really want to know if there are alternatives, most providers in general don't just want to prescribe medication. If they can give you a lifestyle change or a holistic option, that's what they want to do. Right. Um, 
um and they want you know what i'm saying to prevent cyclical events you know some things you can't avoid but if we can prolong the process before they happen that's what most providers want some things are given but um we want you to enjoy life in the meantime and know your body and don't let nobody tell you that nothing's wrong with you until you feel like you've gotten the absolute final answer like I don't care if it's heartburn. I don't care if it's a change in bowel pattern. I don't care if you get in cyclical headaches. I don't care, like, whatever it is uh, for women, if your cycles have changed, if something is not right, right, be adamant that something is not right until they can give you a clear and definitive diagnosis as to what is not right. That's that follow up. That follow up. Absolutely. That follow up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Keep coming well, back. You guys, go ahead, Jay. No, just like, keep coming back. You know. Yeah. Wrong. Keep coming back. I agree. I agree. Be persistent, mm-hmm. and um, you know, your health is important to you, but it can't be more important to your providers than it is to you, because they can reach out to you. Like my 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 doctor's office is constantly reaching out. Okay. Where's your next appointment? We just want to confirm that you you gotta it's gotta be a priority to you. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that anything is wrong. Again, it's about prevention because if you take a proactive approach to your health, you don't have to worry about you know on the back end taking nine thousand pills a day because you you know you you miss those preventative steps in the beginning. Um, and so this has been a very enlightening conversation about, you know, the healthcare disparities in the black community. We know what some of them are. Um, you know, what we've uncovered tonight is that it's not about a lack of access to it. It's priorities and accountability and making sure that you take your health seriously and make it a priority, prioritizing it and and following up with your doctors, with your providers, whomever they may be. So I want to thank Chastity and Jimmy for joining me tonight and letting their expertise and their experiences of, um, you know, in the healthcare industry. Uh, watch this video, have your own watch parties, like, share, and have your own conversations about healthcare and how you can make your healthcare a priority um, and how you can help other people in your family, in your community, take their health into their hands and be more proactive so that we can turn this curve around as relates to Black people and healthcare because it's out there and it's available, but we got to change our mindset and our attitude as it relates to healthcare and what's out there. So I thank you guys so much for tuning in. I'll be yeah. back tonight. We're gonna be talking about um, black. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, men loving their women, but their woman makes more money to than them. So that's that's Wednesday night. Wednesday night at seven o'clock. It's gonna be on, and uh, it's gonna be exciting and interesting and juicy. No, I'll be there. Have an idea. <laughs> I have an idea how that conversation is gonna go. So we love you guys. Get you some rest, and we'll see y'all next time. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Have a good night. Bye bye.